everyone and welcome to the EdTech Podcast, where we aim to improve the dialogue between ed and tech for better innovation and impact. In this week's episode, I'm chatting to someone who has a pretty particular relationship to tech and is thinking about the ed in relation to workplace learning and development. In this week's episode, it's Eat, Sleep, Work, Repeater, Bruce Daisley. And we are chatting about lots that weaves together educational research, schools and learning scaffolding in our adult lives. For example, challenging the resilience orthodoxy. You've hit my pet topic, actually, because I've just spent two years writing a book about resilience and why most of the stuff we're told about resilience is total BS. Challenging unproductive work intensity. And what you discover really quickly is that the big issue, and this is directly relevant to education as well, but the, the big issue was work intensity. Work intensity is this notion of like how much you're expected to do, how many gaps there are. And what you find, everything from creativity to well-being requires a degree of slack in the system. And thinking about how we can best be connected and learn through groups. But for most of us, we actually get a lot of our motivation from other people. We get a lot of motivation from doing things around other people. There's really good evidence of that. If that all sounds exciting, buckle up and listen in. But also, if you're in London or online during March the 28th to the 31st of 2022, as we record this, Bruce will also be speaking at the Economist Impact Innovation at Work Global Week, which is all about reimagining leadership, collaboration and productivity. The event bridges the gap between technology, people and strategy to inform and inspire businesses to innovate in today's workplace. I'm also going to be at Innovation at Work with Work Trip and the EdTech podcast, and this will be moderating a discussion on the 29th with guests from Ocado, Women in Tech and Skyscanner. So we'd love to welcome some of you in the audience. And as usual, the link for registration is in the show notes. But before all of that and this week's episode, there is also the small matter of bet coming up. On Friday the 25th at 11.40 to 12.10, I'll be in the Teaching and Learning Theatre at BET and we will have our live podcast recording in conversation with David Price OBE and author of Power of Us, Valerie Hannon, author of Thrive, The Purpose of Schools in a Changing World, and Sean Gresswell, uh, who is responsible for careers and employability across the Greenwood Academies. There will be guest books available and the coveted EdTech podcast mug for collections. So if you are around, do head down to say hi and listen in. We'll be chatting about portfolio careers and entrepreneurialism in the age of the gig economy and rising self-employment, as well as understanding and empowering young learners better in a world of wicked problems. And also, of course, tons of real world examples of good policy practice and Uh, dare I say it, even funding inside and outside of schools. The guests are hugely experienced, so there's lots to learn and do come along or check it out on the EdTech podcast uh, after the event. So that's this week's roundup all done. I can't wait to get straight into this episode with Bruce, uh, which has all the things I love the most, books, people, sharing ideas and lots of fun and silliness as we go. Okay, here we go. So, um, absolutely delighted today. We have Bruce Daisley. Um, a bit of an intro. Bruce Daisley is a best selling author and technology leader from the UK. He's been regarded as one of the most respected thought leaders on the subject of workplace culture and the future of work. And he spent 12 years running Twitter in Europe and previously YouTube in the UK. His book on improving workplace culture, The Joy of Work, was the Sunday Times number one business bestseller in the spring of 2019. And the Financial Times also made it book of the month and it was shortlisted for CMI Management Book of the Year. His Audible original, No Office Required, was a top 10 audiobook on its release in January 2021. And he is also the founder and host of the top-rated Eat, Sleep, Work, Repeat podcast and excellent associated newsletter. Uh, Bruce has been rated as the top leader in the UK tech sector by Campaign magazine. In a prestigious survey of CEOs and managing directors, in 2020, Bruce was again named the fantasy hire that most leaders would like to make. His fourth time of winning the accolade, 
and other names placed uh, in that list included Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk and Martin Sorrell. Bruce Daisy grew up on a council estate in Birmingham. He started his working career in fast food restaurants to help him pay his way to become the first member of his family to go to university. And after dozens of rejections, Bruce landed his first career role by taking a risk and drawing a cartoon CV of his life, which he mailed to 50 employers. So uh, an amazing overview and chance to get to know you. So welcome, uh, Bruce Daisley. Thank you. As I hear you go through that, I I think some of that is like aggregated on my LinkedIn. Uh, Some of that, you know, and the funny thing about LinkedIn, LinkedIn is such a platform for showing off. So every time something good happens, you think I'll put it on LinkedIn, largely because (laughs) you think that those credentials at some point are going to open a door somewhere. Uh, you know, you said top rated podcast on, on iTunes. I was I was only yesterday. I never look at reviews. <laughs> I was only yesterday looking. Four point six is uh, it's how it's rated. So if anyone wants to go and write a better review on Apple Podcasts, they're very welcome to do so. I can send biscuits. Well, Bruce, I'll go and do that straight away. Largely, I, I sort of never think about anything I've accomplished, but li- LinkedIn is that rare exception. Well, you should feel very proud anyway. Um, so we'll, we'll get into it. Um, I wanted to spend some time today uh, also getting to know you and your work, but also where the overlap might be between edtech, HR tech and uh, learning and development. Um But before all that, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, you grew up on a council estate in Birmingham. Um, So I just wondered if you could give a little bit to our listeners about what your schooling was like. Yeah. um, Yeah, I it's relatively good. And, you know, the the council estate thing, for example, is mainly in there because I do talk to schools. And, you know, there's an organisation called Speakers for Schools that puts uh, speakers into state schools. So that's mainly there for that because you get approached all the time by private schools and uh, and shout out to, you know, anyone in, in sort of an education. But obviously the advantages that kids get in private schools is that you become what you see. You, you know, you imagine what's possible based on what you see and, and uh, kids in state schools just don't get that opportunity. So, so that's why that is somewhere on my LinkedIn. Yeah, my, my education was fairly good. The, you know, the, the thing in Birmingham is that Birmingham has got a slightly selective st- system still now. And so uh, you can, you you know, you can, my dad was ill through most of my childhood. But um, the, you know, the benefit in Birmingham is that there's an 11 plus system. And, and whether you think the 11 plus system is a good thing or a bad thing, you know, that's, as a kid on a council estate, that was aspirational thing for my mum to try and get me into and I actually failed to get into the selective 11 plus school but then they had so many people drop out probably to go to private school that um that I ended up getting in like the day before I, I was going to uh, I, I think my memory's not select or you know relatively late in the process I ended up getting a place there so that probably sort of saw me have some slight advantage interesting thing there you go you go to that which is a selective state school every other kid there went to private primary school it's like oh okay so this is basically just like a subsidized school for for you know people who've done well but yes it it definitely it gave me the opportunity to go to a university for sure yeah, it's the same here. I'm just north of Plymouth. And yeah, it's, it's very much still a sort of grammar school uh, set up at secondary level. So it'd be interesting to experience that. But um, yeah, the, it's, it's, it's dangerous that you mentioned the um, speakers for schools because I've just joined as a school governor and I um, I opted to help them out with their careers ed event at the local primary. And we're, we're on the lookout for people like your story. So you know, people who've come from a state background as a state primary. So I might have to, uh, I might be that annoying person afterwards and say, oh, maybe you should talk to our kids. But um... yeah, yeah. Well, look, you know, I, I'm, I'm always open. I, I try and make time to do those things. So I guess following on from that. So where did you get your grit from? So you talked about doing the 11 plus, getting into the school one day before. Um, but, you know, I know that on your newsletter, resilience comes up and has been talked about as well. But I'm just wondering from a personal experience, 
where where do you get your own sort of grit and drive from? You've hit the, my pet topic, actually, because I've just spent two years writing a book about resilience and why most of the stuff we're told about resilience is total BS. So um, you've hit my pet topic and grit is most definitely one of those subsets of resilience. I guess, you know, to, to my mind, there's probably there's a whole resilience orthodoxy, which is largely clustered under the work of Martin Seligman, but it goes as far as to include grit and, and grit, who, which was created by Angela Duckworth. He's a prodigy of, of Martin Seligman, but also growth mindset. And, you know, the thing about all of these things, part of the resilience orthodoxy, they're a billion dollar business, billion pound enterprise. You know, I spent a long time going through the curriculums of dozens and dozens of British schools and the amount of use of growth mindset is overwhelming. And, you know, the critical thing about that is that it's, it's a wonderful story. What's the notion of resilience? What is the, 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 the underpinning argument of resilience? You get knocked down, you get back up again, right? That's the idea of resilience. It's like this, this ability to withstand shocks to the system and, and to persist. And it's no wonder that resilience is a really appealing thing. If you ask school teachers what the attribute they most desire in their school children is, resilience comes out number one. If you ask parents what's the thing that they most want in their children, resilience comes out number one. Why? Because it's our capacity to deal with things. But the consequence of that is that loads of fairy stories have sprung up around it. There's, a, there's an industry you know, if you've got the most desirable thing in the world, then there's an industry in telling people, here's how to do it, buy this book. Here's how to do it, download this audio book. Um, and the really interesting thing about that, and I could spend an hour and a day debating these things, and, and educationalists often sort of have different perspectives. But the really interesting thing is about that is that I think if you expose the work of Martin Seligman and the work of Carol Dweck mindset to peer-reviewed analysis – the truth is they are fairy stories. They do not exist. They do not work in the way that they're sold. And, you know, the best illustration I can give you of that is Martin Seligman, who's like a far more esteemed psychologist than, you know, I could ever sort of dare to even uh, come be even vaguely uh, compared. But the work of Martin Seligman by peer-reviewed analysis suggests that he's interventions for resilience just don't work. And the best example I can give you is that uh, the US Army gave him a contract, which is regarded in terms of the implementation as being worth in excess of a billion dollars. This, this idea to train every army soldier in the US in resilience. And the results, when, when third parties have gone and an analysed it, they've said it has had zero effect. In fact, there's been a couple of instances where uh, it was forced upon people in camps in Afghanistan. They were forced, everyone was forced to try, take this resilience training. And in a peer review study, resilience went down and the prescription of, of sleeping tablets went up by 80%. And, you know, growth mindset is another example. We, we love the story of growth mindset. The idea that people might, um, their, their learning style might be adapted and they improve. And look, there is very, very, very marginal evidence that for kids who are on the risk of dropping out of school, teaching them growth mindset or teaching them a derivative of growth mindset has an impact. But, you know, otherwise, our best way to summarize the, the research on growth mindset is the work of one psychologist who spent years trying to replicate it. He says, the thing I've found is that the only studies that have demonstrated that growth mindset works have all had one thing in common. Carol Dweck has worked on them. And the things that, ha that prove that growth mindset doesn't work are done by everyone else. And so, you know, firstly, we've got these fairy stories about resilience that unfortunately, because it's such a lucrative business to be in, we've established these ideas. Now, if we truly are open minded and interested to look into resilience and to look into where our personal strength from, comes from, there's really strong evidence of it. You know, when we're recording this, we're right in the midst of the Ukraine crisis. And I think the thing you would say that the leadership of, of President Zelensky imbues is a sense of resilience. But if we look into precisely how he accesses that, it's because resilience isn't this individualistic fairy story that some of us have got and some of us haven't got. I was on this radio interview with Robert Peston and uh, it was right in the midst about a year and a half ago, right in the midst of like the COVID exams when all the exams have been cancelled and Peston breezily sort of swanned into the interview and his diagnosis was, you know, the thing is 
Young people just need to be a bit more resilient. Hang on, hang on. I've been studying here for 12 years. Someone has just plucked my exam results out of the National Lottery machine. Like they seem to bear no relation to the the nights of toil and sweat that I spent preparing for these exams. And the response is, I'm told to be more resilient. And that's exactly what it is. Resilience is go away and be someone else's problem. Resilience is... You know, like, can you not go and the, the way that we talk about resilience? Actually, if you look at resilience, it's what Zelinsky shows. It's a collective strength. It's feeling the support of the people around us. It's feeling emboldened by the, the sort of the collective solidarity we have. The best way to think about resilience is that it's the shift from me to we. It's the it's like the strength we get from feeling supported by those connected to us and i think that's the critical thing so you know i just spent two so you you hit a hot topic <laughs> but, i know oh, i absolutely I, love that and i loved your point about the power of groups and in fact i was looking at your website and someone that you spoke to mm. um dr damien scarf who teaches at the university of mm. otago in new zealand and i loved his quote that it's our connections with those around us the groups we belong to that bolster our resilience and the number of groups we belong to not only bolsters our resilience um you know but he talks about um you know having a positive effect around uh, depression and slowing cognitive decline as we get older and that kind of thing well his story is truly remarkable and like i, I feature him in my book but i had that brilliant co- podcast discussion with him so he was uh, a when he was going through college he was he wasn't the best performing kid in school in fact he he left school with bad grades and spent a year on unemployment benefit and then eventually applied to college. And when he got into college, he had very low ambitions about what he was going to achieve, but he really worked hard. He sort of toiled um, and he achieved C grades and he was thrilled with that. And so he decided he was going to double down. He worked harder. He cut himself off from his friends. He stayed in. He described that he was getting up at 4 a.m., cycling to the library when it opened, staying there all day, working really hard. He got up to B grades. Then he, he decided in his third year he was going to keep going, pushed harder, dropped out of his <laughs> rugby club, stopped seeing his family as much, and he was like, his, his grades were getting better. But the end consequence was he'd, he'd severed himself from all of the groups, and they're far more protective uh, in, a, in an invisible that way that we might imagine. And, you know, the thing that he hinted at there was that – resilience comes from our groups with well, so much research to back this up anyway but his end result is he ended up having a breakdown now today he's a professor of psychology and so he in the same way that i don't know if you ever remember that ted talk by dr jill bolt which was like um this this brain scientist who had a stroke and she she was able to appraise the stages she was going through of this stroke by her knowledge of neuroscience she was like okay so my spatial awareness seems to be um distorted here so this seems to be my i think it was the right hemisphere okay right okay i seem to have greater uh, I, I seem to have lost capacity to understand time right and so she was a, it, it's a truly brilliant it was probably the first ted talk that went viral but in this damien scarf brought the same discipline to his approach he understands psychology he's been able to go back and say wow actually this this social identity I was lacking is the way they would describe it. This, this social identity I was lacking is making me feel fragile. And there's re- beautiful work written on this. Once you start analysing all of this, there's beautiful work written on this. There's a very famous book that was published about 20 years ago in the US called Bowling Alone. And the guy who wrote it was really, he was trying to explore how while we've got certain patterns patterns of behavior that are persisting, we certainly in the US, it was a US book, um, there was a movement towards individualism. So he, the way that he articulated it is he said in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, in the US, a lot of people were member of bowling leagues, you know, like a nuance of, of sort of American life. And he, what he described was by the millennium, still there was the same number of people bowling, but it was a individual thing. You did it with a friend, one and off. You didn't feel part of a group. And his overall conclusion of the group, this sort of, if you wanted to boil the book down to, to one thing, and specifically talking about people in the latter stages of life, but he said, uh, for your health, the best single thing that anyone can do is join a group. If you join a group, you halve your chance of dying by 50% in the next 12 months. And, you know, to give you an illustration, this is why this is such a fascinating area. 
the uh, he said, if you smoke, but you're not part of a group, I would advise you the health benefit of you joining a group is way better than you giving up cigarettes. Wow. Hang on. That's that's an incredible thing. But we don't ever talk about these invisible social bonds that seem to sort of hold us up. They seem to 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 give us some strength and so you know that's um like the whole area of that but damien was brilliant he he went on actually he did some brilliant work especially actually if anyone is thinking about young people he went on and his ted talk talks about this wonderful um so if you search damien scarf on ted talk tedx it was um he he does this wonderful expedition on a a tall ship called the spirit of new zealand and what they do is they take a group of about 60 15 to 18 year olds and they put them on a boat they're not allowed brand clothing they're not allowed their phones and they stay on this boat for 10 days learning to pilot the boat and what you discover is uh, especially peer-reviewed against other kids who don't do do an activity but not this activity uh, their resilience goes up in an enduring way uh, they their connection to others goes up they forge bonds that seem to not only lift them in connection to their friends but lift them overall it's a anyone who's responsible for for young people and and understanding the education process uh, dr damien scarf uh, i think he's an associate professor who's doctor but um he uh he he's his ted talk is truly brilliant but like like you said i i interviewed him on my podcast as well that's fantastic i mean so so many i love the all the themes there and um i'd love to come back to them in relation to how the world of work is changing and perhaps our remote work experiences being more individualistic and now perhaps we're bouncing back and trying to think about some of those collective bonds a bit more. But b- before I get there, um, I'd just like to dwell a little bit on kind of your musings on technology. You almost an- anticipated the great resignation. So you saw how technology does not always work for us, but sometimes we set it up in a way that entraps us. Can you expand a bit on this idea and how you came to it? The the thing for me was, so I worked for four years running YouTube in the UK. Uh, then I left from there and went to Twitter. And I spent eight years initially running Twitter in the UK, then running Twitter across Europe. And I made the mistake of thinking, because like, like, here's what I'll tell you. Tech firms tell you that their culture is way better than everyone else's. And so when people tell you, it's a bit like if people tell you this, this restaurant is really good, there's a degree of dissonance when you get there and it's terrible. You're like, hang on, if everyone else is saying it's good, it must be good. It's just me. The issue's me. It's a bit like one of those, uh, those Dan Ariely sort of social proof things. And then, um, and then so as a consequence, you know, I was like, oh, hang on, the culture at Google's terrible. I mean, like re- literally appalling. And uh, and so when I went to Twitter, I was like, okay, well, I'm, when I first joined, the, it was about the size of, you know, a, a minibus, the the employees in the UK. So like, we're, we're going to build a properly good culture. Objective was people might not recognize it now, but in 10 years, when they look back at their career, they'll go, that was my favorite job. That was the ambition. This is going to be everyone's favorite job. And, you know, it's accountable. So, like, we 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 were really under-resourced compared to our competitors. We were we had a hard job to do, so it was accountable. But I wanted it to be um, progressive, rewarding, and sort of, you know, not in a trite, work hard, play hard way, which is basically break your people. But, but you get a ping pong table. <laughs> Exactly. Um, so it's not just like the, the culture shouldn't be, yeah, you're going to work really hard, but then drink loads of Jaeger bombs. Uh, but it was, it was like, how can you make a progressive culture? Anyway, um, I told myself I'd done a really good job at it and then it went spectacularly wrong. <laughs> and then, so that's where my interest in these things came from. It's like, you know, we had loads of people leaving with no job to go to. We had like a, an exhaustion when you were greeting colleagues, either in meetings or in corridors, they just like had a dead, dead, dead eyed look to them. I'm, I'm, like, I'm, okay, I've got well. like scenes from succession running through my head. <laughs> yeah. 28 days later might be closer okay. to it. <laughs> sort of, you know, um, loads of zombies sort of striding into a room dead eyed anyway. But, um, Yes. So, uh, but succession too. And, uh, but anyway, so, um, 
So I, I set about thinking, about, okay, we'll go fix it. And what you discover really quickly is that the big issue, and this is directly relevant to education as well, but the, the big issue was work intensity. Work intensity is this notion of like how much you're expected to do, how many gaps there are. And what you find, everything from creativity to well-being requires a degree of slack in the system. You know, I, I'm really fixated with the work of, uh, a woman called Zainab Tan, and Zainab Tan studies retail environments, you know, supermarkets, stores. And you might, th- all of us might think, you know, what can we learn about our jobs about from retail? But actually, her studies show you you can learn a lot. And you know, if there was one book I was going to recommend, I think you asked me that in the in the prep for this. You know, Zainab Tan, Zainab Tan's The Good Job Strategy is a brilliant read. It's probably six, seven years old now, but it's like, you know, there's a couple of beautiful moments in it reminding you like there's a beautiful moment in it where uh, a downs kid is working in a supermarket and they are the supermarket quick trip i think it was in the us are worried that the line for his checkout is so long and so you know they, they go over and they're saying to people do you want to go into another line is he really going slow and it's because yeah, the, <laughs> I'm going to cry. But the, the kids had, had written a little, because he was packing people's goods, he'd written a little thought for the day in, a, in everyone's bag. Really beautiful, really beautiful. And it, what you get from it is that, you know, what you get actually is that while a lot of people talk about purpose and things like that, there's just a dignity in doing your job well. There's a dignity in feeling I've done my job well today. Anyway, her book is brilliant. But um but the uh, so anyway, I was like interested in what I could do to to make the jobs for my colleagues better, to improve, you know, do that. And like, as, as Zainab Tan showed, the best companies operate with slack in the system. They operate with some spare capacity. If you're hoping to get people to be productive from nine in the morning till six in the evening, what you find is that the absence of slack means that you just got no um, resilience. There's that word. You've got no sort of. Uh, you, you've got no. Yeah, that's right. You just can't. You can't. You can't. You know, like you can operate like like that in emergency, but it's just the system has got no adaptability to it. Yeah, and then go so. back to the technology as well. So just thinking about that supermarket example, it's like we're sort of applying the same um, ideas of assessment and productivity in the workplace. So thinking about yeah, assessment techniques on the checkout. So how quickly am I getting this stuff through? And if it's not hitting these certain benchmarks, you know, and so it's sort of applying a almost like a computerized mindset to humans rather than mm. saying what was the best use of our creative capability. So, I mean, I guess I guess my my point in bringing that up was thinking about, you know, if there are people listening in and they're thinking or they're involved in setting up some kind of digital transformation or digital strategy process you know that might be in the workplace it might be for within a university or a school it's moving away I think from that idea of just driving productivity through technology no doubt and look you know the experiment we've all been a part of in the last two years is it's been a really interesting exercise in productivity you know the thing I always say is that you know over the last two years most office workers would say they've no doubt been more productive they've got more done you know as long as their volume of email uh, emails and video calls isn't too long, they've got more done. Uh, but most people would say they don't feel as connected and work hasn't been much fun. And it sort of begs big questions. You know, does work need to be fun? And uh, do you need to be connected? And look, there's some jobs where you don't. Um, there's some jobs where connection to other people isn't important. You know, you're an individual con- contributor. You don't need to be supported or connected to other people uh, and these these other jobs that don't need to be fun but for most of us we actually get a lot of our motivation from other people we get a, a lot of motivation from doing things around, around other people There's really good evidence of that you know loads of evidence from people like professor robin dunbar who gets people to do things activities alongside each other and what you discover these people doing things alongside each other um energizes them creates a higher sense of of endorphin release and you know you, you get wonderful examples of it. i love the example that comes from the late 
chief rabbi in the UK, a, a guy called uh, Dr. Jonathan Sachs. And he talks about a sort of beautiful reminder. You know, there's, there's a really interesting thing about the the, um, the Jewish people because they're often throughout their, you know, the, the whole of their existence, they've been in exile, really. They've, they've you know, and apart from the last 50 years, they've never had somewhere to live. And so the reason why that's relevant is a wonderful conversation between the Dalai Lama and Jonathan Sachs on YouTube. And they talk about how if you're trying to understand how culture is passed down and how we pass down traditions and learnings and values, then actually, you know, the the Jewish people are a really good example because they've had to, in exile, they've had to learn what are the ways to that we instill instill things and, and meaning so like firstly he's a beautiful thinker but the um he talks about this word that um that anyone who speaks hebrew always tells me that you know it's a well-known word but it's this word simha and s-i-m-c-h-a i sort of wrote about it on my newsletter a couple of months ago and uh the, the the idea of simha is it's a word it's in the bible i think 11 times and it's always translated as joy but he said it misses something when you translate it as joy because it's not joy it's a participle of we so it's it's like we've had joy um and it's a shared experience and what he says is that often when we reflect on our most memorable moments our favorite moments the moments that formed us they often have this simha as part of them they are a shared moment of joy it's really easy for us to, to neglect that because it's very easy for us to to say oh you know i had a lot of fun there i did a and you know to think about maybe moments that we've had fun on our own but the things that really are formative for us are normally moments of shared joy and i think there's a truth to that about our work experience as well you know the the moments where we really feel like we've accomplished something they're normally shared moments with other people and any of us who've been out and about i've been to handful of events and done other things and you know i was at an event yesterday and there's something that's uh, that's unreplaceable about being in a room with a bunch of other people that an energy is produced a simha is produced by being around other people and, and i think you know we can sometimes find ourselves optimizing for productivity thinking you know we need to get this done and this done and this done, and we miss all of the gaps, all of the, the the mortar that holds it all together. So I think, you know, look, being clear that we need both a yin and a yang is probably really important. Yeah, absolutely love that. I mean, I think I spoke about before that um, I'm working on a new startup, which is trying to basically create a marketplace or a digital tool to to make that easier for companies to, to book meaningful offsites. So... Mm with an emphasis on the learning and development aspects so not just the venues and not just the food which is really important in the same way that you just talked about in terms of a shared collective experience but also you know bringing in someone to help facilitate that building between colleagues and enabling so it's it's great to hear I mean I've, I've been looking at some examples out there with companies experimenting in this space so I think Salesforce recently announced their sort of trailblazer ranch and um, I wondered what you're hearing. I know you've had guests on the podcast with um, companies including the fast-growing Hopin and more recently had Lloyd's, but are there any companies that sort of seem to be on the right path in terms of that balance between human interaction, use of technology? Yeah, it's it's really interesting. I mean, look, you know, the, the big thing, I've, I've been doing this podcast for maybe five years, six years, and so the last two years, it's really interesting because my personal obsession you know i got into this because i love i love laughing at work really i loved sort of you know it was a good day for me if i went home at the end of the day and i'd laugh 20 times and you know so i i used to sit with the people in the office who weren't part of any other team that was like we were the team without a team and we just used to laugh all day between meetings or going to meetings and laugh and that was a, a big judge for me. It's incredibly superficial. And no doubt people with MBAs think uh, would, would think that I'm uh, lacking in any substance. But it was a big motivator for me. It's a, and, it's a big tragedy, isn't it? For um, I'm, I'm thinking especially of young people, but any people in the workplace that they're, they are missing out on some of these, uh, you know, collective experiences and that joy of connecking in between. And it does become quite task orientated. There's a, there's a good book that came out this year called The Power of Fun by Catherine Price. And actually, far better, better than that, 
is that a journalist for The Guardian, Al Hunt, wrote an, a piece where she tried to put it into practice. And it's like, so it's much better. Al Hunt, the power of fun, if you search that, you'll find it. And um, she, she sets about having more fun. And there's a really interesting thing uh, because effectively we, we kind of eliminate fun from our lives. So we think that it's unproductive and unhelpful. And, and what this book reminds you is that you know, actually optimising your life for these things is a life well lived. It's not a sort of a life wasted. Uh, so th- that, firstly, is, is a brilliant sort of wake-up call. But the, my favourite book of last year was a book called Humour Seriously by Jennifer Aker and Naomi Bagdonas. Of course it is. <laughs> In fact, I interviewed them. And uh, But that book is brilliant. Firstly, I love the fact it's by two women because like women have, have unfortunately had this inference that women aren't funny and you know we've had to deal with sort of the curse of that throughout our lives and um, sure. but particularly they write this book saying that how valuable humor in the workplace is firstly as a tool you know a tool to sort of lubricate the frictions of work and secondly a way to just make life feel more enjoyable more pleasurable so um so two good books i think that both emphasize that 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 theme uh, this really resonates with me because i quite often feel like i find it hard to um just be in the room uh, it with a very serious face on in serious meetings <laughs> like without taking on that satirical one layer up where you're looking at it and thinking this is all that to some level everything's quite ridiculous like that's just human nature one question i had for you is you know talking to people around the work trick concept and who work in hr or work with people lots of people intuitively get get the concept they get like being in an, in an alternative environment and how that helps spark ideas and that kind of thing and connecting with their colleagues in a, in a way that's memorable and then they're thinking about, OK, well, how do I present this in a way that doesn't just look like fun? Because fun, it doesn't like um, have the same currency, perhaps when mm. it's, you know, a line in a budget. <laughs> and it's not just fun. It is like, an you know, a really important factor that's going to aid competitive edge if you bring it da- back down to all of these things. But I think for people listening and they're thinking, I get it, my colleagues get it. But it's still taking that senior leadership team on a, on a journey, and then there's mm. the kind of how do you measure fun if we have to measure it in order to get it get it kind of through. It's a really difficult one. I, I guess the critical thing there would be to try and seek some way to measure team cohesion mm. in a proper way. The challenge is that you know if you say to most people in a normal day, we. we play game theory right if you say to to people fill in a survey about how tightly connected you feel to your team you just say yes i feel really connected you know (laughs) because there's no benefit in you saying i don't feel connected (laughs) because then all of a sudden you find yourself there's loads more there's loads more bs turns up because people are like oh why is everyone not connected next time i'm just going to take i'm connected so you like so like the challenge is how to accurately measure that the integrity of the data is the critical thing but what you find of course is that number one when people laugh together they you only laugh with people you trust you only laugh with people you feel affiliated to and so you know getting some sense of shared simha actually forges a really strong sense of team cohesiveness it forges a bond that actually is enduring the critical thing is though how do you demonstrate that probably that's that's the challenge there is like is there a meaningful way to demonstrate you know psychological safety comes from that as well when teams feel like they they see each other they hear each other they feel understood by each other then psychological safety comes from that when we sort of view colleagues with suspicion you know the experience the last two years is really interesting for that we've joined a lot of zoom calls where a couple of people are cameras off we don't really fully recognize everyone's name you know if someone says to you what are you concerned about right now you're like who's that <laughs> who's that cameras off face down there i'm not i'm not going to say what i'm thinking i'm yeah. just going to say something innocuous or we you know we start doing emails while we're on a video call so like you know sort of it's um yeah i think there's a holy grail in measuring team cohesiveness but It'd be really interesting to see if you could properly get into measuring that in a meaningful way, I think. Brilliant. Yeah, that's on my to do. <laughs> and mm. have, I know that when you spoke to Camilla, um, is it Boyer from Hopin? Yeah. She was talking a little bit about 
you know, they grew, they grew really fast in a remote capacity and now they're trying to experiment with these in-person events to build that exact team cohesion that you talked about and meet their colleagues that have been onboarded remotely. Are there any other companies that you chatted to that are sort of also finding that that role of team offsite, so not just going into the office, but actually going to a different space is also becoming more important? Um, I mean, I guess we see it with a couple of the patterns of behaviour. You mentioned Salesforce there are saying that, you know, their office now is really their offsite space. Dropbox are saying that you would come to the office for experiences, not just to do work. And I think that's, that's a greater understanding of using the office as a tool to achieve something different. If you go into the office, I think, you know, the interesting lesson is we, we often come to the experience we're going through with a degree of narrative fallacy. And the, the, the curse of narrative fallacy is you think you're at the end of the story hmm. every time you, you, you appraise a situation. So a lot of people, we've spent two years talking about hybrid working. You know, from April 2020, a lot of us have been saying, OK, we're never going back to the office in the same way we did before. You know, there's been a degree of people gradually coming to that conclusion. There's still a, you know going through the stages of grief there's still some people in in denial or bargaining about that but um you know once we accept okay our relationship with the office is different now we're actually using the technology that's available to us then you start thinking um well what will happen and the mistake a lot of us are thinking is oh this model that some workplaces are doing tuesday wednesday thursday or monday tuesday thursday uh, that's the end of the story well, it's not at all. That's where we are now. But what you find, a lot of people who've gone to hybrid working will report, oh, yeah, I, I'm making a massive journey in. It's cost me £30 to get in, either with parking or trains or sandwiches or drinks after work. It's cost me £30 to get in. And I'm just doing video calls with people at home. Yeah. And, you know, the frustration of that is starting to come out. It's the reason why probably the world's leading expert on looking at all of this is a... Stanford professor called Nick Bloom and Nick Bloom says the final end up will be that most organizations are remote first and the reason why he says that obviously that's not applicable for most schools but um, but the reason why he says that is he says what generally defines the movement in the workforce is the demands of the most talented workers and so he says what you know what you generally find is that the most talented workers set the standard that other organizations find themselves pursuing well the most talented workers are demanding the freedom to work in a more flexible way that's a really interesting proposition i think i think that's really interesting when we go back to education as well because there's an idea of what a leader looks like and we've become a bit more sophisticated around how that might be different but essentially confident good at public speaking in person um, you know, all of those things. Whereas actually, if we are going to be remote first, you know, that, that can benefit a different type of person who's just actually really proficient at getting their work done, perhaps. And, you know, it's a different type of communication that's needed and that kind of thing. So just in terms of how that relates back to, you know, what is taught at the later stages of school, university or college, it could be quite some interesting ramifications there as well. Absolutely. I think, you know, the, the skills that are going to become more valued are uh, people who can, managers who can trust their workers and, you know, probably therefore someone who understands the process of building trust, which is, you know, clear expectations for each other, um, you know, transparent communication, discussion about discussion about awkward and uncomfortable things as well as things that are, you know, fun and frivolous, a, a transparent, psychologically safe dialogue. All of those things are probably really important in terms of managers going forward, manage, measuring on outputs, not inputs. All of those things, I think, are going to be incredibly important. And I think the, you know, the, the skills of managers maybe in the past was all about building st- tight affiliation you know we're taking the team to the pub at the end of the week you know having a laugh with people maybe not necessarily getting into intense 
conversations about feelings and objectives, but rather sort of a superficial trying to keep the, the team buoyed up and, and motivated. Like a Downing Street approach to management. <laughs> Fill them full of wine and let them stumble into the garden. I mean, that's really and interesting then... as well, because the conversations that I've had is, as we get down to sort of Gen Z level as well, they're not that interested in that old model of like someone in a suit standing up, giving a speech and then everyone getting pissed. Like now yep. it's like, actually, I want an opportunity for self-development in the workplace. I want that kind of employee hospitality bit, which is about, you know, what have you got to offer me? Like, in addition to remote work, the experiences that you talked about, like Dropbox going into the office. Um, but but yeah, that, that role of the employer as somewhere where you're going to develop, you're going to learn, you're going to continue to learn as you're in, in within that organisation. So I think that's also quite interesting in, in, in terms of a overlap between perhaps ed tech, learning and development and the culture of the organisation as well. No doubt. I mean, you know, just the, the demands upon young people mean that sort of spending half their salary going to the pub just feels like a frivolous waste of cash. They've got to pay off the student loans. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, the expectations have changed. And I think managers probably haven't changed to reflect that. Most of us make the mistake of thinking what our experience of work was is what the next generation's experience of work. You know, I know what works. It's why you end up at the moment. Quite often I get asked to speak to organisations and, and normally if there's someone in their 50s doing the briefing, they'll say, we know that being back in the office is essential for our job. And like it begs the question, OK, if it's essential for your job and you've not done it for the last two years, have you had a bad couple of years? And they generally go, no, we've actually had a really good couple of years. <laughs> uh, shout out to the team, really good couple of years, but we need to be back in the office. And so... Our instincts, the sort of the look that the whole of learning is generally based on learning heuristics, right? Learning rules of thumb that are going to save you time in the future. And we, we probably, um, the, the challenge for a lot of us is that, you know, the, the rules that are applied, applied for us don't necessarily apply for the next generation the same way. OK, cool. Let's go back to that last question then before we kind of wrap up, because it's been amazing. So... At the beginning, we gave that amazing introduction because you have achieved and done a huge amount. So congratulations on that. And um, so just to kind of make you feel better, what's your biggest win and or failure in life that you have learned from? Yeah, an easy one for me to think of. I don't think about this. You know, one of the benefits I've got, and it's a cognitive flaw I've got, is that I'm not remotely reflective. <laughs> so, uh, so I never think about... I never appraise my life. I go straight to sleep, straight away. Like you know, but I've always been the case of that. Even when I was unemployed in Birmingham, like I've never. It's not necessarily. Do you, just a, do you a know? I, I'm. I would love to be like that. How? Uh, how is that possible? <laughs> but I think there's something wrong with me in the sense that, uh, you know, like. <sighs> I don't think my brain fully works properly in the sense that like when I'm playing a game of cards, if I'm traveling somewhere, quite often when I was at Twitter, we'd play cards, not for money, uh, but we'd play games of cards while we're traveling. And, um, and like I would often make decisions when I was playing cards. That everyone was like, what, what was that? Why? I was like, oh, okay, my, my brain obviously doesn't process things directly correctly um and so things like that i just i'm not remotely reflective i never once think about the bad things in my life i do actually count my blessings but i never think but so so i never think about these but things but when i was unemployed writing those cvs to loads of places and i was actually applying to record companies i'm still now obsessed with brand new pop music that's what i was obsessed with there and I, and i got offered the job of post boy at virgin records which was like a dream job for me. Post boy, get your way in there, be sort of a fun character around the office, bit of energy, you know, and hopefully sort of work your way up. That was my dream, dream job. Um, and I, when, when I was offered the job, the, the woman said, uh, you just have to drive down to Labrick Grove Post Office every day in the transit. I'm like, okay, I've got to tell you, I don't have a driving license but i've done one crash course before and they cancelled the test i'll do a crash course in driving and i know i'll be able to take it do it next week take it like the end of the next week and if i pass my driving test i'll start the following monday i mean talk about setting yourself up so i had to move out to london the following weekend 
Um, I said, if I pass my driving test, I'll come. And if I fail my driving test, I won't. And I failed my driving test. Oh, no. um, I, could have, I could have been a player. In, I could, you could be chatting to me now. I could be a player in the music industry. I, I mean, the music, music industry has just had a horrific two decades, so maybe I was better off out of it. But um, so that was the. I feel that like you're going to come back round to that, though. You'll weave that into your life, I'm sure. Yeah, that's it. Me running a, the the next <laughs> album campaign for Bieber. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, and then finally, Bruce, what have you got coming up in 2022? Well, anyone who liked the stuff I was talking about before about resilience and the myth of resilience, uh, I've got a book coming out about that in August and uh, it's called Fortitude. So that's my sort of big focus this year. A lot of, there's a lot of, I think, very applicable stuff, you know, really interesting exploration into where resilience really comes from. Some f- really eye opening stories about outstanding performance and actually what underpinned it you know one of the things that's really fascinating these a a whole exploration of a brilliant bit of work that uk sport did uk sport this sort of elite uh, um sporting organization they did this study in 2009 which looked at why some athletes win gold medals and some don't and what they discovered was that all of their gold medalists that they studied uh, had all had a significant moment of childhood trauma. And all of the ones who hadn't, uh, only a quarter, the, all of the ones who didn't win gold, uh, only a quarter of them had had it. Wow. It, and it goes, and look, the whole book is an exploration of what other forces at work there. Is that a degree of misdirection? Because you might superficially go, there is there's resilience. There is resilient people. There's some people who have knockbacks and they go on and succeed but there's far more at work there mm. so that book is out you can pre-order it now i'm not going to stop you you can uh, pre-order it now, but um <laughs> but that that's out in august oh yeah i mean um that's such a fascinating topic well bruce thank you so much i've absolutely loved this i can't wait to go back and listen to it and and write down all the book recommendations and dig into some of those and yeah wishing you the best of luck with your book coming out this year and uh have a great rest of your week as well Appreciate it. Thank you. Lovely chat. It was fun. That's all for this week's episode. Huge thank you to Bruce Daisley. I absolutely love his approach of soaking up what's going on in the world and then sharing it in an easy to understand way for all of us. So do go and check out his excellent newsletter, which is uh, does exactly that. Also, don't forget those events coming up. So the podcast is at BET and then Innovation at Work, both in London over the next weeks. Coming up next time, more episodes from the Female EdTech Fellowship. And until then, bye-bye.